Hey there, and welcome to my home in Fairfax, Virginia. I'm Josh Rushing, sitting in for the irreplaceable Femi OK, and this is the stream. Today we're asking, is Sudan on the path to democracy still? Now look, if you're watching this on YouTube, you see that box over there? Yeah, right there. That is the live YouTube chat. Help me out, get in the conversation. We have a producer in there that's gonna get your comments and some of your questions to me, and I'm gonna to try to get them in the show. Now, let me catch you up on what's been happening in Sudan. We're just over a year from Omar Bashir's government being toppled. Uh, the new government set a goal of elections in 2022. So that's what everyone's watching. Some of the problems is there were deadlines along the way, like establishing a legislative council, that they've already missed those deadlines. So concerns are arising, particularly as the economy seems to be in dire shape with shortages of food, fuel, electricity, and inflation on the rise. Now, new protests hit the streets just at the end of June. Take a look at those here. The demands we want fulfilled are the formation of a legislative council that can supervise over the government's activities. The second demand is the achievement of comprehensive and just peace. And the third is a civil state. When your third demand is a civil state, it's a sign there may be trouble. Um, there's been this whole set of laws that came out in the last week or so that seemed to liberalize things, but other laws were cracking down. And there have been conservative protests since then. Check out some of these conservative voices. Not everyone's happy about the new laws. We won't allow bars to reopen. We won't allow prostitution again. This people is a Muslim people. And this is the voice of the people. <laughs> Us in Sudan, men, women, and children are all Muslims by nature. We won't allow any interference in Islam. We won't allow any distortion of the laws of Islam. And today, it is our duty to take to the streets until the government falls, God willing. And of course, these challenges fall on the desk of Prime Minister Abdullah Habdak. Here's what he's had to say about it. I think we have to manage expectations of our people. Rightly so, they have very high expectations from this revolution creating broad-based alliance for the economic reform program. You know so well, economics and politics has to be aligned. It's not an easy job. We're working on that, getting it right in the peace process, addressing the debt issue. But also, like the rest of the world, as if we do not have enough challenges in our plates, we were hit with this COVID-19. And what seems to be the most recent news here is that Omar Bashir may actually face a new set of trials beginning as early as this week. Of course, he's already been convicted once of corruption, but this trial will be about the coup which he led in 1989. Now, to discuss all this and more, we're joined by an exciting panel of guests, all from Khartoum. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, but I'm going to begin with Al Jazeera English's own Hibba Morgan. Hibba, hey, how are you? Looks like there might be a delay there or her picture's frozen. So we're going to move on. Kalud, can you introduce yourself and tell us why you're here? Of course, I am a, a, the, the managing director of a think tank here in Khartoum, and we set up to uh, help with the transition. So helping civil society and the government uh, in order to be able to kind of manage its way through this very short term transition that it's going through. Uh, perfect. Thanks. Hey, Heba. I just introduced you as Al Jazeera English is own, and it seemed like there was a pause in the video. Can you can you tell us just a bit about where you are and what you've been up to? Well, I'm in uh, Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, obviously, and uh, I've been covering the stories um, that are uh, the latest political developments and social developments that are happening here in Sudan. And one of them, obviously, is the latest legal reforms and the debates around it. Great, thank you, Eva. We were joined by one further guest, which is Katab, but I think we're having some issues with his signal at the moment. So uh, I'll bring him in once we get a good signal from him and have him introduce himself to you. Let's begin with some of those re legal reforms you were just talking about there, Heba. Let's start with the ones that are affecting the women in Sudan. Is this a win for women? Well, I've spoken to a lot of women about this and, and I've been monitoring the social media reactions uh, by women and men. Uh, most of them feel like, yes, this, this is 
a few steps towards what they want. It's not the complete one that they've been asking for, but the fact that um, you know FGM has now been banned is something that they, they're celebrating. The fact that women, mothers, can travel with their kids without the permission of the father, or rather without the presence of the father, because just for background, in the past, a woman cannot travel with her own son, regardless of the reason, without the father being there, without him giving his own personal approval and, and signing off on the fact that yes, the mother can travel with the child. Even getting a passport, you know, one of the main requirements for having an identity or an official identity, uh, having a nationality ID and, and a passport, you can't do that without the presence of the father. Now they can do that. So for them, that's that's a big step. It's what they've been asking for. And, and there are people who lost their children because they couldn't travel with their children, uh, their sick children, because the father hasn't given up, especially separated or divorced parents. That has been very complicated. There were times where they had to go to ju judges and sometimes it gets struck down. So for them, that, that is an improvement and that's something they've been asking for for years. Uh, Kalut, can I ask you, I, I've read some uh, analysts who are skeptical of these laws, that they're kind of a wink to donors in the West and that they'll affect the privileged classes, maybe in Khartoum, more than they will uh, women across the rest of the, the country. Can you talk a bit about that? I think taken in the broader political context, it is another win for the transition, you know, domestic to nationally, much battle, if you will, and signaling a break away from the Islamist policy of the last 40 years. Um, but this does come in response to the 30th of June protests that did uh, want a kind of more responsive, uh, faster level of reform. And so, uh, you know, there are very important gains to be had. For example, uh, stripping the state security apparatus of the powers uh, to torture, that affects or can affect everybody. Um, criminalizing FGM and laws that benefit women, I would argue, benefit the whole of society because it's about what kind of society do you want to live in? One that um, you know, has some level of injustice to anyone will surely have a you know, knock on effect or injustice to everyone, to paraphrase um, Martin Luther King. So you know, it's apostasy laws which have been weaponized and used against political activists wherever they are, um, and ending you know, death, the death penalty for uh, same-sex relations um, as well, and, and who used to be um, mostly affected by that are more precarious uh, people, such as tea ladies or people on the street who have very few social uh, defenses. And public flogging is the kind of thing that takes place when uh, the morality police serves as, you know, judge, jury, and executioner. And I think limiting the state's own powers to be able to oppress people in that way is a very important signal for the people of Sudan that actually there is a break away from the oppressive political climate of the past 30 years, the past um, 40 years, because we have to remember that Sharia law was brought in in 1983, uh, six years before Bashir um, seized power. So this is a long-standing issue, it's only now starting to be um, counted. Mm. Katab, are you there now? Can you hear me? Great, I want to bring you into the conversation. Can you first begin, because you missed our round of introductions by letting the audience know who you are. We've talked about the new set of laws, and we talked specifically about the ones that affected women and some of the more liberalizing ones. But I want to post to you that not all the laws were quite liberalizing. The new information law seems to be trying to crack down on maybe journalists and uh, dissent. Can, can you speak to that, please? Uh, okay, uh, first I have an option objection of to the mechanism of for passing uh, these laws uh, as there was no parliament that reflect people's opinion in order to avoid any opposition to the reform uh, some legal professionals say that the legal amendments that occurred were a mistake by the minister of justice dr nosrotin abdurbari uh, in the absence of parliament, the minister should have invited all uh, components of society to discuss the laws and then come up with recommendation to be, uh, to be submitted to the cabinet. Uh, about, the, about the laws, uh, I have a, a tip here about, for, uh, about uh, allowing alcohol for non-Muslims. So uh, it's all right for non-Muslims to, to drink alcohol, but uh, there's a problem here because this clause is inconsistent with the constitutional declaration, the constitutional uh, document. As it mentioned, uh, that uh, rights and duties in the Republic of Sudan are based on citizenship without discrimination. 
based on race or religion. And there is no constitutional court here in Sudan now to revise this mistake. There is no constitutional court until now. Uh, about the, so. when, when you say that, you know, that, that there is no constitution, there, when you say that there's no legislative assembly or parliament to debate that power sharing agreement that was signed between the military and the protest movement, or rather the forces of freedom and change coalition, made it very clear that in the absence of a parliament, because it was supposed to be formed three months uh, after the start of the transition period. Now, in the absence of a parliament, the Council of Ministers and the Sovereign Council together make up a parliament until one is appointed. I and I, I think, you know, saying that, they, that there was no parliament, there wasn't a parliament, maybe it's not fully representative because there are no civil societies there, but it, it does fairly make up the parliament for the time being until one is actually formed, which would be more representative. Do you agree with me on that one? And yes, furthermore, fine. there's also oh, the, okay. you know, the, the fact that when the Sharia laws first came in in 1983, they were done by presidential <laughs> decree by Jafar and Nimeri, who was a dictator at the time. And we didn't hear such you know, cries of um, lack of protocol at the time from certain quarters, but it's those quarters now who are crying foul because the laws are not in accordance with their wishes. But what we're seeing mm. is that the number of people that are in, in, in favor of these laws are much more than the numbers who, are, who have come out in the past week or so to, um, to criticize these laws. So I, what, what about I the laws, though, affecting journalists and, and, and dissent? What about the new information laws? Mass protests. It is a concern, Josh, you know, especially for me mm. as a journalist. I think the fact that, you know, anything that you say or write... Uh, even on social media, which is uh, your personal thing, it doesn't necessarily have to reflect the views of the media out there that you work uh, with. You can be, you can be uh, tried for that, you can be persecuted for that. And I think that kind of affects freedom of speech, whether a person is a journalist, whether it's activist, whether it's just everyday you know, people on the streets. Now, what they say they have to be very careful about. I don't think that was what was intended. Um, if you look at the broader, the reforms as a whole, the fact that you know they're trying to move a few steps forward, I don't think the intention was to try to stifle press freedom. But but these are going to be the side effects of having you know opening the ways for people to 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 to, to be able to say to to, net, to to narrow down what they want to say. You know because I I I'll, if I'm an ordinary person, I have to be very careful about what I tweet. I have to be very care careful about what I post on Facebook. Uh, that being said, you know it, it may be a way to try to crack down on, on news or as they would put it or on false information. Uh, we've seen it over the past few months, whether it's on, you know, like political reforms that are happening, whether it's on, you know, the pandemic, the coronavirus, people posting this information. So maybe the goal was to try to control that. But then it, it, it's like a double-edged sword where you're going to have, you know, you're controlling the false information that is flowing, but you're also stifling on press freedom or rather freedom of expression because people won't be able to express it easily. You know, we've seen it just in the past few days, the military coming out and saying, we are going to be trying journalists and activists for what they say, even if they're outside the country. So this is the side effect of that law. Yeah, but we're seeing some skepticism of the military in our YouTube chat right now. This is from Iskander uh, Gabriel. The military are still in power and using the protest as an excuse to rig elections. Um, I want to bring in a video comment from someone in our community. This is David Kawuwa. He's a professor at the University of Nottingham. Can we hear that now? In Sudan, the question of what needs to be put in place in order to ensure food transition is answered by a number of uh, urgent measures. One, civilian oversight, an increase in civilian superintending over the military, knowing that the military is a fundamental stumbling block to the transition. Second, the importance to depoliticize the military and retrench the military back to the barracks. And I think the third is also to decrease the economic footprint of the military within the national economy and also ensuring that you strengthen constitutional rule of law and strengthen civil liberties and broaden and guarantee uh, human rights. So the, I think everyone is looking at that power sharing agreement that you were talking about, Hiba, between the military and civil authority. I, I'm, I'm wondering how is the balance of power there? I know that in the protest in, in on June 30th, they were saying that the military was in far in charge of far too much to include some day to day economic issues that the military perhaps shouldn't be involved in. Yes, indeed. So the power sharing agreement states that it's going to be a civilian led 
transitional government, which is basically there's a sovereign council which has six civilians and five military. Uh, the transition period is 39 months. 21 will be led by the military, 18 by the civilians. The first 21 will be the military. Now, the one, the, the body that is supposed to be in charge of day-to-day -day affairs is the executive led by the Prime Minister Abdul Hamdok, who's a civilian. And it's also a civilian majority with the exception, obviously, of uh, the head of police or the Minister of Interior, who is obviously from the police, and uh, the Minister of Defense, who's going to be from the military. So technically speaking, at least on paper, they're the ones who are supposed to be in charge. The reason why we saw protests on 30th of June is the fact that people feel like the military is still in charge because they see that, you know, the, the head of the, econo the emergency economic committee is, is being headed by, uh, you know, the deputy head of the sovereign council, who's a military. Uh, he's the head of a paramilitary force, the rapid support forces, General Kandan Beglo. So the fact that he's in charge of, of the body that is dealing uh, with the current economic crisis, inflation of 140%, uh, they, they're not happy about it. They, they, they think that the civilians should be the one who are leading this one. Uh, the peace talks that are right, right, right now going on between you know, several armed groups and the government. Uh, the prime minister came when he was appointed and said, you know, the first goal of my transition period is to bring peace. But General Hamdan Doglo, again, is the one who's leading that committee, who's the one who's going on forward with it. His, um, the members of the sovereign council, most of the military, are the ones who are representative in these discussions between uh, the armed groups and, uh, and the transitional government. So people are seeing that, you know, those goals of the government, improving economy, bringing peace, the military is right now taking the lead and they're not happy about that. I'm gonna get in our YouTube audience again here. Khalid, I'm gonna toss this question to you. It's from someone named Wada Adam. My question for the panel is, why are the new ministers making these amendments while they weren't voted in by the people yet? I think this is a question that Katab might uh, agree with the sentiment of. Can, can you respond to that, Khalid? Uh, okay. Uh, well, I think. I think. Uh, the... Okay, hold on. Go on, go on. Yeah, I think. I think the issue is that um, you know when people aren't happy with what the with the transitional government's doing, they question its legitimacy. Um, but when they are happy with what it's doing, they tend not to. So there is a certain element of bias there. But I think that the constitutional uh, you know document made it very clear last year this government was going to have the full legitimacy until such time as a, a government could be elected. And its role as a transitional government is to put in place, you know, the exact wishes that people were chanting, but that's where their mandate comes from. Um, you know, historically, we haven't had much uh, luck with transitions. We've had even less luck with demo democratic elections. Um, so, you know, neither of those is the guarantee that everyone will get what they want. In fact, oh, I think it's actually a good there are that are easy going on. I think that's a true mark that there is some level of, you know, democratic will being played out rather than one group being targeted. Kitab, is it democratic will we're seeing happening here? It's not democratic, but uh, I think the, the minister, Dr. Nasruddin, uh, is working to, to guarantee the, the rights of, of the minority in Sudan and to, to apply all uh, to apply all international uh, uh, agreements that the Sudan signed on, and uh, I think it's it's a good uh, it's good uh, amendments. Uh, and let me go back again to the freedom of expression restriction about the cyber crimes law. Actually, I think uh, I'm a digital rights activist. Uh, actually, it's a bad law, and it's uh, the it's a new dictatorship. It's the same 2007 law, but uh, they have just increased the punishment period without updating any crimes. Uh, you know, the technology is in a continuous evolution mode, and the cyber crimes are in synchronization with it too. Uh, the law didn't criminalize the internet shutdown while there was an uh, internet shutdown case before just one year, and the uh, World Bank estimated the daily loss of Sudan by, uh, by $45 billion per day. Besides that, uh, the law is criminalizing the disinformation and, and misinformation. And I see on the other side, the state should activate the right to access act as if you want to apply the accountability of, uh, for uh, misinformation and disinformation, you should provide the information and make it available for all. So we should make new cyber crimes law to, to make it up to date and to make uh, freedom of separate, uh, the freedom of expression uh, available more. So uh, we've got about five minutes in the show left. There are a couple of big topics I want to move on to. Uh, COVID-19 is hitting Sudan just like it's hitting everywhere else. 
and it's really exacerbating some of the economic situations there. The World Bank and the IMF has a special fund set up to help countries with their COVID response. It's a $50 billion fund. But as I understand it, Sudan cannot access that money because they're still listed by the United States State Department as a state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, Hib, is that your understanding of it? And what's the impact of that? How important is that? Well, uh, first of all, like you said, yes, that the global pandemic, the coronavirus has hit Sudan hard. Uh, the, the, there is an issue, or there are issues rather, when it comes to testing, tracing, uh, providing the health services. Uh, I know people who have called uh, the, the, the contagious disease or infectious diseases department to try to get to tested or taken to their homes. Uh, that didn't go down well because people don't show up. We've seen people, you know, we've seen a rise in the number of uh, death cases. So, yes, it did hit the country hard. We've seen the inflation rising 140%. Before the coronavirus, it was around 90%. So, yes, Sudan uh, has actually said it very clearly that they are in need of that help. And we've seen a donor conference on the 25th of June where countries came together providing support for assistance. Uh, there were pro programs launched by the transitional government. Uh, we've seen them in the talks with the uh, with the uh, International Monetary Fund and with the World Bank to get access to grants. Now, the issue of the sanctions is affecting the country. That is true. But we've also seen this government trying as much as it can, again, with the constrictions that they have in place to try to provide assistance. So they've started this, um, you know, the, the family support program trying to target families with limited incomes. Lots of initiatives that we've seen. Now, to see it on the, translated on the ground would be a little bit hard. First of all, Sudan's population has gone up, Josh. Uh, we used to uh, live on the fact that it was uh, 40, billion, 40 million uh, people. Uh, statistics to show that it's actually 43 million, and one out of every four is actually uh, in, 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 uh, facing some kind of starvation, some level of starvation. So it is facing some challenges, and it does need that aid from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which is what they've been trying to talk uh, to the two bodies about for the past few months now. Are they going to be on track to meet the election deadline 2022? What are we, two years away from that, right? Uh, well, yes, we're already a third of the way in, and there's, the signs are not encouraging that that, uh, the dead, that, that deadline, deadline would be very um, you know, achievable. I personally think the, the transition should be extended, but of course there are many political um, you know, parties and groups that would, have, uh, would take issue with that. The key is now to maximize, I suppose, while we don't know how long the transition period would last for, to maximize on the gains that we can make in the short period of time. And in order to do that, the government needs to be able to be able to uh, behave both politically and sort trench these changes, the legal changes, the economic changes, into the governing system of the country so that people actually all over the country will be able to feel the changes that have been made. I've got about a minute left here, and I'm going to toss this to you. If they do not make the deadline of elections in 2022, are they at risk of being this kind of Eritrean model of transition forever? Ah, we, we've lost Katab Hibba. Did you hear Just that to your question? Point, though. Or Kalud, did you hear the question? Go for it. I mean, Sudan has transitioned since independence, since 1956, and it just has little short bursts of, of, of governance, if you will. And so mm -hmm. I think what we need to do is have more bold political and economic um, you know, uh, policies that are able to move, away, move Sudan away from this period of perpetual transition and actually set, you know, build the state ahead of the previous revolution. So I think we're on the right track on the right track. I'm going to bring the YouTube audience in here for the final word. Uh, the, this is from Ding Medell, and it says the reforms chart a path to relative secularism, opening the country to foreigners. It also changes the perception of Sudan in the international stage. So everyone's really looking on that stage as to what happens in Sudan. Will they make the elections in 2022? I really want to thank my guests, Galu Katab, and especially Hiba Morgan from Mount Syria English being with us today from Khartoum, and thank you for joining us here and in our YouTube live chat. We'll see you next time.